Good morning, guys. Good morning. How's the how's the volume? Can you hear me? Yes. Good. So we have covered four chapters so far in the textbook. And the next one is going to be slightly different. So here we're going to actually talk about transport proteins. So basically proteins which have evolved to transport molecules such as oxygen that by itself is poorly soluble in biological medium. So remember when, when if you draw a structure of oxygen, right, it's nonpolar. Let me do that. Share screen. Share screen. Key topics. Here's our oxygen. Are you guys familiar with the triplet and singlet oxygen? So if you draw the Lewis dot structure, that's what that's where we should start. Before we even start discussing the protein that transport it, transports it, let's try to draw the structure of oxygen. Is this the Lewis dot structure of oxygen? Each oxygen has an octet of electrons, correct? Yes. Yes, but that's too many electrons. I have too many electrons. Well, it should be six and six, so it should be 12. So shouldn't there be a double bond between the two oxygens? Right, should be a double bond between the two oxygens. Okay, so let me, okay, that trick didn't work on you. How about this? Let's see if I can trick you now. How about that one? That seems correct to me. So everybody likes the structure? Well, it turns out that this is the excited state structure. Excited state. And ground state structure looks like this. So you basically unpair one of the double bonds and you will have single electrons, right? So these single electrons so this will be ground state, which means this is the state where oxygen molecule is resting without any kind of excitation. So, but the point is, is that oxygen is a nonpolar molecule. It has electrons, so it can form some kind of um, 
uh, bonds with hydrogens, right? But it carries no charge. Carries no charge, so water solubility is not so great. So, um, so let's go back uh, to the first slide. And so, what we're going to learn in this, what are we going to learn in this chapter? So basically, this chapter is going to revolve about around the oxygen and its transport through the biological systems. Well, we're going to learn on this example, we're going to learn how the uh, ligands, which are small molecules, right? Which small molecules, which bind to proteins. So we're going to try to uh, describe this in a quantitative manner, right? We're going to use some math. Um, we're going to look at the structural features of these interactions, right? Specifically where oxygen is sitting in this uh, globin um, in the protein that transports it. How it's regulated physiologically, right? So in other words, can you um, regulate how much oxygen will bind to the protein in the body? For example, um, you when your molecule goes to well, I already, I already tell you it's hemoglobin. When hemoglobin goes to the lungs, right? you want to increase the amount of oxygen that binds to it, right? So you want to have high affinity. When hemoglobin moves into the tissue, if the affinity stays high, then the hemoglobin will not release that oxygen, right? So there must be a mechanism for hemoglobin to change its affinity for oxygen, increase it when it's in the lungs, and decrease it when it's in the tissue. And hemoglobin has evolved to do just that. And we'll talk about the mechanisms for control and control of antibody antigen interaction, right? So, so here basically the chapter will, will be dedicated to a small molecule ligand protein interaction. So key topics, so uh, the ligands we're going to look at today, so they're going to be, it's going to be reversible, right? So what that means, what's the problem with irreversible? Do you know what I mean, right? So irreversible means uh, it'll go to the site on the protein and perform a chemical reaction and react with one of the amino acids residues. Why is this number one? A reversible binding of ligands is essential. Because you don't want to permanently occupy a protein? That's right. That's right. You don't want to kill the protein, right? So you want the protein to be able to, to uh, transport lots of lots of oxygen molecules. Right, or otherwise you just use one protein per oxygen molecule and that's just not going to be, so the, the protein will not be very effective in doing that. Another important topic that we need to talk about is what's known as induced fit. So one mistake people often do, and people still do that, and computer software still um, struggles with, with this, is uh, lock and key hypothesis. Lock and key, has anybody heard of that? Yeah. yeah. Lock and key. So in this case, the protein will be the lock right and your ligand that binds to it will be the key and so the key will uniquely fit into this lock 
so the idea is this is what's responsible for specificity this is how the biological interactions are made specific specificity But it turns out that actually things are not as straightforward, which is which presents a lot of problem for computer um, computational chemists because it's virtually impossible to predict what's what's going to happen with the protein or enzyme once the ligand comes in. So it turns out that uh, the the key has the ability to change its shape a little bit, and the protein has the ability to change its shape a little bit. So when the key arrives, the lock will um, undergo a slight shift in a, in a shape to accommodate the best possible confirmation for the key, right? So there will be some um, some plane going on between the key and the lock, so that they both achieve the low min minimum energy uh, confirmation. So one of the key principles for um, ligand binding to um, biological receptors is what's known as induced fit. And obviously uh, induced fit can also uh, be a, a local phenomenon, but can also be um, transmitted across various subunits, in which case we talk about cooperativity. Right, so it can um, the key, the ligand binding on one subunit can be felt on a different subunit, and we'll talk about that in, when we discuss hemoglobin. And interaction can be regulated. So we'll spend quite a bit of time understanding this phenomenon using hemoglobin. Okay, so um, transport proteins are primarily uh, uh, globular proteins, okay? So for example, myoglobin. Myoglobin is a storage protein. Basically, it grabs oxygen and sits in the muscle tissue until oxygen is required, until physical activity brings the necessity to release oxygen into the tissue. Now ferritin uh, is another one. This one, um, which molecule does ferritin store? Iron. iron, right? From ferrous, iron. Right, so ferritin, it, uh, it's designed by evolution to actually one molecule of this protein can store up to 5,000 molecules of iron. So iron, keep in mind, iron is a, quite a sensitive molecule, can undergo oxidation and can give rise to free radicals. So iron is not a joke. Iron could be quite a dangerous molecule because it can give rise to free radicals in reactive oxygen species. So iron needs to be keep, kept an eye on. Uh, transport of ions and molecules, hemoglobin, uh, serotonin, transporter. Uh, so do you guys understand what that does? So it obviously transports serotonin, but uh, from where and from where and to where? Anybody knows? Serotonin released from the brain? Yeah, so... Uh, Remember how the synapses work, right? Yeah. If this is a synapse, this is a presynaptic neuron. This is post synaptic.
both synaptic. And so when the action potential arises, uh, when it comes, the um, neurotransmitter serotonin is spilled into the synaptic cleft, right? So this is cleft. left and then for uh, for this um, to be ready for the next action potential this serotonin quickly needs to be reabsorbed into the presynaptic neuron and that's what the synaptic uh, serotonin transporter does right so basically there are transporters for all the uh, neurotransmitters right acetyl acetylcholine uh, dopamine uh, GABA, aminobutyric acid, and so forth. All right, so um, let's quickly defense against pathogens. Uh, really quickly, for the presynaptic and postsynaptic, so the, the function, just to make sure I have it right, of the serotonin transporter is to take the serotonin that's in the, pre, uh, that's in the cleft and bring it back into the presynaptic. Uh, right. Right. Yeah, so there are these uh, vesicles. So basically what will happen is um, um, the function of the serotonin transporter will be to package these serotonin molecules into vesicles. And these vesicles will then um, sit in a presynaptic neuron waiting for the next action potential. Okay. All right. So we're going to call molecule that binds to a protein a ligand. The region where it binds, going to call we're going to call the binding site. And in general, uh, what the, what makes our life easier is that with these non-covalent interactions, um, when we talk about protein structure, it's going to be the same non-covalent interactions, right? So hydrogen bonding, electrostatic interactions, salt bridges, hydrogen. So, so basically, all the stuff we already covered, right? So. Biology is very uh, conservative in general. Biology is very conservative. Um, oh, life is a very conservative um, system, right? So um, why develop so many things for the same process, right? So if you can utilize it once, maybe you can utilize it somewhere else. So the same thing, if you have this set of non-covalent interactions, why develop new ones, right? You can use the same non-covalent interactions and in making the protein, protein interactions and utilizing them for ligand binding to binding sites. So a little bit of math treatment, some simple math. So here's our protein, here's our ligand. Now there is a, um, a rate constant Ka, small k, right? With this rate constant, the ligand will occupy the binding site, but the ligand can also leave. So this is association, this is dissociation, right? Ligand can, can leave, and when the Ka e equals Kd, right? When the association, sorry, they don't equal, they don't equal. Uh, when when this left hand side, so this is the rate law for the formation of the complex. This is the rate law for the dissociation of the complex. Um, when they equal, then the process reaches equilibrium. Uh, I'm sorry, guys. My kids are going crazy. Just one second.
Sorry about that. So when the left-hand side equals the right-hand side, then the, pro the process reaches equilibrium, right? And then we can, um, for the equilibrium constant, then um, what we can do is uh, um, the equilibrium composition is characterized by the equilibrium association, Ka, and it's reciprocal equilibrium dissociation. So they are opposite, right? If this, um, the, the, the relationship is reciprocal between the two. And so uh, remember how the association equilibrium constant is calculated. It's the product over starting materials, right? Product over the starting materials. And for the KD, it's gonna be the, the opposite because the process is gonna be going in the opposite direction. And so uh, let's do a little bit of analysis. Um, just to derive some uh, parameters which can be used to calculate certain things to describe these equilibria and describe how um, potent ligands are, as if we can compare one ligand to another. So to, to derive some parameters which we can use to compare the ligands among each other. So uh, we will uh, define what's known as a fraction of occupied binding sites, theta, theta. Okay, so there's a letter theta. And basically what it tells you uh, is that, so this is the uh, concentration of the sites on the protein that are occupied, right? So basically concentration of the protein with the ligand on it. And there'll be some protein which does not have a ligand yet, right? So protein with the ligand over protein with the ligand plus the protein. So this is the fraction of occupied binding sites. Now, this is the association um, equilibrium constant. So we're gonna use that. And we are going to plug it in into this expression. Right, so uh, we're gonna substitute PL with KALP and eliminate PL. Uh, just very simple rearrangements and uh, eliminations, which we can do in 10 seconds, right? And then uh, we will end up with the expression for theta, which is shown here and taken to advantage, taken advantage of the reciprocal relationship between Ka and Kd, we can finally uh, come, um, arrive at this expression. And uh, dissociation constant is more commonly used than association constant. And so, uh, let's uh, look at this expression. What does it give you? Well, first of all, you can see that this obviously theta will be maximal, which is a one, right? It cannot be more than one, but it will be maximal when KD is zero, right? So uh, you, so for the strong interaction, you want a small number for KD. The smaller the KD, the stronger the interaction between the ligand and the protein. Uh, the second important. You said that the stronger the uh, the reaction, the smaller the KD. Yeah, the strong, the smaller the KD, the stronger the interaction. Would it be reverse? It would be reverse for Ka, right? Yeah. For Ka, you want, you want Ka to be large. And secondly, uh, another thing we can learn from this is that Kd is the concentration of the ligand at which half of all the binding sites are occupied, right? You can see here. So if this is, um, 
the proportional binding sites occupied, right? Maximum is going to be one. So it will be half maximal when um, the ligand concentration equals KD, right? So if you plug in, and this is your theta. Right, and then one half. So again, you want the KG to be very small, right? So you half of the binding sites will be occupied with um, small, with small concentration of the ligand. Okay. Just to clarify, so when the KD, uh, so the KD equals the point at which half of the um, binding sites are occupied? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, um, so example of what we just talked about. So this is oxygen binding to myoglobin. So myoglobin is a globular protein. Is a globular protein. And it has, let's see, it has eight alpha helix fragments labeled A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, right? And there are also these little bridges which connect the alpha helices together. So they are named by two letters. So for example, this segment here is AB. And what that means is that the segment that, com that connects alpha helix A with the alpha helix B. So let me see if there's Where's my porphyrin? My porphyrin. Let me actually bring this into the discussion. So uh, for hemoglobin, so the way iron is held in hemoglobin is through a large structure known as heme. You have the slide later on, I just brought it here because I need it for discussion.
large structure known as heme. And so the iron can be positioned right in the middle, right in the middle, making contacts with four nitrogens. So this structure is known as a pyrrole. It's a heterocyclic ring. Heterocyclic ring. And so four of them combined together will form a structure of the heme. And iron will sit right in the middle. And you can see here, heme actually is a very nice, a beautiful looking structure and it's, um, it's fully aromatic. It's fully aromatic. And you can see what happens here. So iron, so if there are two nitrogens, sort of four nitrogens, one on each of the four corners of the heme, there are two coordination sites, one above the iron atom and one below the iron atom. And so iron will utilize these two to bond with the protein and oxygen. So this is shown here. So you can see here, um, so this is the heme sitting right there. That sphere, that sphere is iron. And there is this histidine, histidine nitrogen. Now histidine of the alpha helix F and it's also number 93 from the amino terminus of the F of the F alpha helix. Make sense? Well, what's the significance of the 93 and the 64? Right, so um, myoglobin totally has 153 amino acids. Okay. So this histidine is the amino acid number 93 from the amino terminus. So it's the 93rd amino acid from in like in the line in the chain. Is that what that means? Yeah, in the linear chain of amino acids. From amino terminus. But it's also amino acid number eight in the F segment of, of myoglobin. Okay, it's just uh, two ways, uh, two ways describe its position. And so you see what happens. So histidine, remember it has a nitrogen of its own, right? So uh, iron basically is bonded to four nitrogens of the pyrrole of the uh, heme of the pyrrole um, heterocycles of the heme. And it's also bonded to the nitrogen of histidine at this position. And the other position on the other side remains open to bind to oxygen. Can you say again uh, what you meant by histidine is eight in the myoglobin F? Say it again. Uh, can you explain what, what you meant by uh, histidine is F8? So F, so I told you there are eight alpha helices, alpha helical segments in myoglobin and each of them is uh, given an a letter a b c d e f g h right and so this one is f segment f and so okay. in this segment this histidine is the eighth amino acid starting from the beginning of this segment 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, so here is uh, we're gonna modify the um, our mathematical expression since uh, this is just for solution, right? Since oxygen is actually a gas, so uh, we're gonna put in the um, partial pressures instead of the ligand con ligand concentration. So partial pressure of oxygen, partial pressure of oxygen. And this P50, that's the partial pressure of oxygen at which half of the Banyan sites of my myoglobin are occupied with oxygen. Does that make sense? Partial pressure of oxygen at which half of the Banyan sites are occupied. All right, just uh, some general things for us to, uh, to be aware of. So the interaction strength can be impressed, expressed as, so association binding constant, so we just talked about that. So the higher the association constant, the stronger the binding. For dissociation is the other way around and the units are molar. So, uh, so as far as the magnitudes, you want KD to be in a nanomolar region. So um, remember nanomolar is 10 to the negative ninth, right? So uh, majority of drugs on the market Majority of drugs on the market have KDs in nanomolar region. So um, obviously you can describe uh, in terms of concentration or you can describe interaction in terms of free energy. Um, remember the expression for delta G, always use to keep that in mind. Expression for Ka, for Kd, various relationships. So and so forth, so so forth. Just uh, this slide, just as a reminder of some important relationships and numbers. Okay. So for the exam next week, will we be doing calculations like this? Uh, what kind of calculations? Like using the delta G, the K, the KD. Uh, takes time, right? I don't. I don't give you much time, so. My guess is probably not that many. You, um, I may ask you some conceptual questions about it, but uh, not the actual math. Thank you. And so this is some uh, now biological examples of uh, various types of these interactions. The highest, in fact, the highest affinity that has ever been described between molecules is the affinity between biotin, which is a small molecule, and avidin, which is a protein. So it's in the KD in a 10 to the negative 15th molar region. 10 to the negative 15th. 
Anybody knows the units? So we have millimolar. Micromolar. What's next? Nanomolar. Molar. Nanomolar. What's next? Is it pico? Pico. So for pico, we have um, ten to the negative. 12, right? And what's 10 to the negative 15th? Anybody? Is it femto? Femto. Perfect. Femtomolar. So it's a femtomolar binding. This is a, it's extremely strong binding. But uh, it's, it doesn't, the, you know, the strong binding is not always a good thing, right? If you have a drug and um, it has such a strong binding to its target, how do you get rid of it? It's gonna get stuck to your target in the body to some kind of enzyme and how do you wash it out? And if the drug has some um, side effects, what do you do? Right, you're gonna be living with these side effects because you can't get rid of the drug. So uh, it's always a balance, right? So you want strong binding, but so that you can administer drug in smaller doses, but the, the um, but there's a limit on that. And so you can see here, so this is where this uh, protein DNA interaction occurs in the nanomolar region. You can see, I told you nanomolar is where things happen usually, right? And enzyme substrate is actually even lower, micromolar, even millimolar. Um, why do you think that is? Why do you think uh, other types of recognition, DNA protein, antibody, antigen, have higher affinity than enzyme substrate. Because enzymes are more temporary than like a sequence specific protein in DNA. Yeah, they are temporary. And uh, you want the enzymes to, um, you don't want the product to slow down the process, right? So once the enzyme performs the reaction, you want the product leave so that the enzyme is ready for the next cycle. Right, so the enzymes are, they have to be specific, they have to recognize their substrate, but to a certain degree, right? Substrate comes in, the reaction is done, and the, sub and the product has to leave. If the product has not left, the new substrate cannot come in and the reaction is slow. So here's what uh, we talked a little bit about the lock and key model. So uh, high specificity in general um, can be explained by the complementarity of the binding site and the ligand. Complementarity in size, shape, charge, hydrophobic, hydrophilic character. And the lock and key model by Emil Fisher. 1894 assumes that these surfaces are preformed. But the more modern treatment, just like I told you, is called induced fit, right? So you can see here, 
uh, both actually the, the ligand and the protein may undergo shape change. May undergo a shape change and uh, it totally, as a result, the structures of both have changed and the overall structure may be even stronger than if it was just the preformed lock and key. All right, so let's see where we are. Okay, a few, few more slides. We already kind of talked about this a little bit. So, uh, so globins are oxygen binding proteins and protein side chains lack affinity for O2. So we can't really use any kind of protein. It has to be actually a special design to capture oxygen, to capture oxygen. And so metals, all bind, oh, most metals will bind to oxygen, right? Because oxygen is, is a non-metal electronegative. Metals are electropositive. So in general, metal oxygen bond will form, metal oxides. Um, the, the problem is, so let's say if you use heme by itself, right? So you put iron in the, in the heme without any kind of protein, the trouble is that this free heme could be oxidized to iron three plus, very reactive. And so what happens is that you actually surround, you put this heme into the protein. You put the heme into the protein and the protein will prevent, will prevent iron to undergo, from undergoing oxidation, right? So you need the heme to hold the oxygen and you need the protein to control its oxidative properties. And so there are two proteins we're gonna talk about, myoglobin and hemoglobin. So myoglobin is primarily used for storage and hemoglobin used for transport. So we already looked at this structure. And so you can see if this is the plane of the porphyrin urine system, right? So we're gonna be looking along it. So this plane is actually perpendicular to the plane of the screen. So here's the imidazole, imidazole of the histidine. So sometimes this histidine is known as a uh, proximal histidine, right? Remember it's F8. F8 histidine F8 and uh, on the other side that's where the oxygen will come in right and will be either stored or transported by myoglobin or hemoglobin all right I think we're going to stop here are there any questions about anything today? I have a quick question, kind of like in general, like preparing for the exam, do you think you can kind of get together a list of like um, pages we should read from the book that would help us like you did last lecture? Yeah, I'll do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anything else? All right. So I'll see you guys on Friday. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.